If I had to come up with a moral here, it would be this. You have a lot to lose when you start loving your religion more than your own family, your own intellect, and yourself. That, in my opinion, was William. He happily walked away from a thriving community to chop cordwood while his family starved in the name of the, quote, true gospel. He was the kind of Christian that everybody hates. Hopelessly closed-minded, unteachable, judgmental to the hilt, and hiding behind a veil of false piety and self-deprecation. The cringe factor for me was high with this scene yes. because it felt to me like it took so much of this kid's brain power yeah. to remember this stuff and recite it back. It's like, Jesus Christ, there's going to be no room left for anything practical no. because his head is so full of this shit that it's all he can think about. That to me is terrifying. Just how much of this hysteria there actually was. Welcome to Unbound a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective and a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And it's time to get unbound. You know, there is, at this moment in time, a strip of masking tape up in the upper left-hand corner of my laptop with two <laughs> words on it. You know what words they are? What words? Black Philip. Because <laughs> I came home after work and just took a couple of hits of some of my favorite stuff. And I'm certain that if I don't have this staring at me, I'm going to say Black Peter yes. all night. Black Peter is an entire other story. Black Philip is who we're going to be talking about tonight. Happy Halloween, by the way, or Samhain, or Sunday, or whatever you want to call today. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And tonight, we have a spooky story that we want to tell you wherein we travel back to the 1600s again for a New England folktale that may as well have come out of Salem, parts of which might just have. Decades before the Salem witch hysteria, we have Robert Eggers' The Witch. Settle in, maybe pop some corn, turn out the lights and get comfy. Have we got a story for you? <laughs> now, I do want to start this one out with a trigger warning and probably should have done this in other shows, too. It's just not something that I think about, unfortunately. But in this instance, it's something that kind of affects me, too. So I just wanted to let people know if you haven't seen this movie and you don't know some of its contents, this story does, in fact, deal with infant and child death by unnatural means, and there is at least implied by some interpretations child rape. Mm. So you want to be careful. Yeah. If these things are triggering to you, then just understand that they're coming. I don't want to tell you to not listen, but you know you. So yeah. you know, do with that information what you need to do with it. Before we get into the heart of this story, we're going to look at it scene by scene and really, really dive into it. Right. But before we do that, just want to let you know that our Patreon is active at patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network. Any amount of money that you can help with is going to be appreciated. And we start at the $5 level. That's just about a dollar or a little bit more per episode. And for that, you get early access to all of our content. And as we grow, we're going to be adding more to the Patreon offerings. So if you have the means to help us out, we would sure appreciate it. And if not, just keep doing what you're doing. Tell someone new about the show this week. Leave your five-star ratings, your good reviews, all of the things that help podcasts grow. We can use your help. And we're seeing some significant growth just right. lately. I'm starting to see people picking and choosing from old episodes, especially last October's episodes. Yeah. Uh, the Salem episode has gotten some play, I think, probably because we told people last week to listen to it. So there are also another 84 episodes besides that one. <laughs> And then this one that you're listening to tonight, goodness gracious, we are on episode 86. Yeah. That's kind of amazing to me. Everything that you do, whether it's money or just letting someone on social media know that an episode is out there that might appeal to them, it's all helpful. And we really do appreciate the effort that you guys make to help us grow in whatever way that you can. I'm going to leave that short and sweet this week because, man, do we have a lot to talk about. This is the longest list of show notes that I think I've produced for this show. And then when you add Shell's notes into the mix, 
it's even longer. So, <laughs> you know, we're going to take our time with this and tell the story right and interject a few things here and there, thoughts, feelings, emotions, tie-ins with some of the things that we experienced as evangelicals. But mostly we just want to get this story out. It's really, really cool. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, first time I saw this movie, it really didn't appeal to me that much. Right. But having watched it now, I think about five times, it gets better <laughs> every single time I watch it. And it may sound silly to say it since we're already talking about it, but let's just dive right into our main topic right now. So dim the lights in the corner of your mind. The show is about to begin, ladies and gentlemen. And as the scene opens dark and gloomy music like a funeral dirge begins the opening scene. The first thing we see in this movie is Thomason listening to her father speak his case in a very tense public trial slash hearing, whatever you want to call it. She has a real blank slate kind of innocence about her at the very beginning of all this. What we're seeing here is basically her whole life up until now. These people, this way of thinking, and the conflict between her father and the townspeople are all she knows of life in New England. Right. But we also learned that the family came to the New England plantation from England and had at least a modest degree of lifestyle before making the trip across the pond. There's some nebulous disagreement over some kind of difference of opinion between William and the church members in his village. William has a real John Proctor vibe in this scene, but John Proctor wasn't anywhere near this bad shit. Yeah. He was also right, so he had that going for yeah. him. This guy... He's just a buffoon, and it's obvious from the start. And this was what he was accused of. He was publicly speaking out against the beliefs of the church and dishonoring the laws of the commonwealth and the church with his prideful conceit. I like that phrase. It has a nice one-two punch about it that describes this kind of religious arrogance really, really well. He was asked to be intended to keep rousing the rabble, basically, if yeah. he was if he intended to just not shut up about all of this crazy religious shit that he believed in. And uh, he gives the most arrogant, smarmy answer possible. He says, quote, if my conscience sees fit. Wow. Oh, my God. It's like I, I heard that line. And it actually did bring back some memories because, yeah. you know, I, I have to be honest here. I had some very strong opinions when I was part of this thing called the evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I butted horns with people over a lot of things, too. Right. And, you know, I think that at one point or another, most of us who go through that period in our lives have at least moments where we take on these kind of really, really bad attitudes about certain things, yeah. certain thoughts, certain doctrines, whatever. And that's what we're seeing here. We're just seeing this guy oozing with smarm and just asserting his rightness and refusing to back down and just, you know, playing nice with the other plantationers. This part's even better. He says, I cannot be judged by false Christians, for I have done nothing but preach Christ's true gospel. Mm. Oh my goodness. The arrogance is strong with this one. Yes. In 17th century terms, this guy was an ultra conservative living among moderates and liberals. He was also the kind of Christian that everybody hates, hopelessly closed minded, unteachable, judgmental to the hilt, and hiding behind a veil of false piety and self deprecation. But he was quite committed. I'll give him that. Oh, <laughs> And the discount Jesus look about this guy, totally on purpose, I promise. The look was meant to go with his whole white savior complex. I have to convince these people that my ideas are correct. Yeah. That's pretty much what's going on here. But of course, we're at the point now where he's giving up and just saying, fuck it. He's in his mind. He's thinking that he is shaking their dust from his shoes and walking away. Right. That's really what's going through his mind. It seems like the dispute began over William's position on the subject of salvation and the way he pushed it on the residents of the plantation. The plantation people were fed up with his shit, but they were also afraid of him. Yeah. That kind of crazy can unravel an entire community. A few decades after the story took place, it actually did. Right. You know, because this is like the early 1600s. Right. I think this is around 1630, 1632, yeah. something like along that. those lines. Yeah. And William's dogma lies more on the side of things like original sin and the need for redemption, whereas the people he locked horns with 
were likely more Calvinist in the way they thought and just didn't like this deluded zealot going around accusing people of being dirty sinners in need of grace. <laughs> Calvinism was big among the Puritans. And as we find out later, even William has tendencies toward predestination, at least when it comes to the people he cares about. And very unlike the average Christian, William has uncertainties about the afterlife and the ability to know if one has obtained salvation. There's that kind of Calvinist thinking kind of oozing yeah. its way in there too. Through all of this, we learn one thing about William. He was an extremist in the midst of people who might have been influenced by religion, but hadn't been driven crazy by it the way he had. He was as toxic as the day is long, and banishing him was a good call. And you found something in your research right. that kind of relates to this, that, yes. that has some interesting parallels. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was looking up banishment as a punishment, and I found out about Anne Hutchinson who I hadn't read about before, but she was a key figure in the antinomianist controversy, which was a theological debate concerning the covenant of grace and the covenant of works, and was a midwife who was very open with others about her religious understanding, and eventually came to have a group of women and men meet in her house to study scripture. She was a strong advocate for free grace, that is, no works could earn one's place in heaven. This went against established Puritan teachings and caused a rift in the church. She was eventually tried for slandering and criticizing other ministers, as well as sedition and contempt of court. Eventually, she was convicted and banished, but unlike William and Catherine, she had a supportive husband who went to Connecticut to find a new home for them. And here is a quote from Anne Hutchinson. You have no power over my body, neither can you do me any harm, for I am in the hands of the eternal Jehovah, my Savior. I am at his appointment. The bounds of my habitation are cast in heaven. No further do I esteem of any mortal man than creatures in his hand. I fear none but the great Jehovah, which hath foretold me of these things, and I do verily believe that he will deliver me out of your hands. Therefore take heed in how you proceed against me, for I know that for this you go about to do to me, God will ruin you and your posterity and this whole state. Ouch. Yeah. But you know what? It sounds like the type of thing that William would have said. Yeah, there's and... definitely William vibes there. Oh, totally. And given the sheer number of sources that went into creating this script, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there were elements of her story oh, yeah. that made it into at least the character profile of yeah. William. On the heels of that, we're going to go back to the plantation where the family is now being kicked out. William is literally told to take your leave and trouble us no further. Oof. You know, yeah. this guy was not liked. And just like Anne Hutchinson, I yeah. I don't think that she was very well liked. No. And, you know, I'm reading your notes about her and I'm thinking, you know, maybe these two should have gotten together and gone bowling. But yeah, right? it's probably better that they didn't. Did. Oh, yeah. And because I... twice the crazy <laughs> in one package. Yeah, I don't right. know about that. I wanted to talk about, like, I think Anne's last words were, why am I being banished? And they tell her. The court knows why, and we're satisfied. They Ooh. didn't tell her. They just, like, said, mm -hmm. nope, just fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, once you've made enough enemies, like, anywhere, yeah. they can do one of several things. You know, they can make it just really, really uncomfortable for you to stay. They can do what's done here and banish you. Or if you're, like part of a crime syndicate or something you know they have other ways of making you go away <laughs> at least these people took a little bit more of a civilized approach to this problem this guy had a family they banished the family but you know i just get the impression that if any of them had come to their senses yeah and decided they wanted to go back that there would at least be a consideration yeah. of taking some of them back i don't know about william yeah i know some of them might have had a shot if they didn't let things get as far as they did, but I don't want to get ahead. I want to stay right on the timeline here. Right. So they're kicked out and there's this foreboding music as we watch them leave the plantation and we watch the gates close behind them. It's all very dramatic. Yeah. 
This is it. They are on their own. No home, no community, nothing but themselves and daddy's delusions. And we learn in short form just how inept this guy is, too. That might have been part of the reason why he got kicked out. He probably contributed little to the community and spent most of his time annoying people with his true gospel. He can't farm. He can't hunt. All he can do well is chop cordwood. So that's what he does. And he does it a lot. Yeah. It's his coping mechanism. So whenever things get just a little bit stressful around the farm, William just retires to the chopping block. Yeah. And just starts chopping cordwood. And he does this many times through the course of the movie. In fact, he did this so much that he had wood stacked up higher than his house. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, after like three or four watches, yeah. you know, I know the story at this point. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, great, they're going to starve, but they'll die warm. Yeah. Because this guy can't raise enough crops to get them through the winter. And he just, he's like doing a jig of glee when he finds a, a hare in the woods. Yeah. To shoot so his family can have dinner. You know, he's like so excited to find this hare yeah. that he can bring home and say, look on dinner, you know, but yeah. he even fucks that up. And we're going to get to that in a second. Then we get an establishing shot of the woods that is on the outskirts of this farm that they're settling. Yeah. And we get this outright panicky and threatening music that builds to a really, really eerie crescendo. And then, boom, silence. Yep. Very next scene, once again, we got a shot of Thomason, and this time she's praying. The prayer Thomason prays is so self-deprecating. I mean, oh, some God. of the prayers in this movie, yeah. just listening to them, it just made my skin crawl. Yeah. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. She says, I here confess I've lived in sin. I've been idle of my work, disobedient of my parents, neglectful of my prayer. I have in secret played upon thy Sabbath and broken every one of thy commandments and thoughts. I followed the desires of mine own will and not the Holy Spirit. I know I deserve all shame and misery in this life and everlasting hellfire, but I beg thee, for the sake of thy son, forgive me, show me mercy, show me thy light. And I'm thinking this is what they pushed on us as evangelicals. Oh, sure. This whole notion of never, ever, ever being good enough and constantly having to ask for forgiveness again and rededicate and all of that bullshit. Yeah. So as I'm watching this, and I watched it with the closed captioning so yeah. that I could really get a feel for what was being said, because sometimes in this movie, the dialect can yeah. be a little bit difficult to follow. Mm -hmm. But with the subtitles, the closed captioning, much, much, much better. So yeah. that's a little secret for you. If you weren't able to get into this movie before, it's probably because you weren't understanding some of what was being said. Watch it with the subtitles. It takes on an entire other dimension and you will understand it better. But this is, this is what they do. And as I'm watching these words scroll across the screen, it's like this is precisely the guilt trip. Yeah. That they used to lay on us mm -hmm. as evangelicals. And William's family has had so much of this stuff crammed into their heads. I have no idea how any of them stayed sane for yeah. as long as they did. So we get a little bit of a time jump here. Catherine is pregnant with Samuel when all of this begins. And now all of a sudden, poof, baby. <laughs> we just meet this baby. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering who delivered that kid. I mean, seriously, is was that Thomason? I don't think that William had anything to do with it. Yeah. If anything at all, Thomason was probably the one that helped the most. Right. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised if she was pretty much on her own. Because, yeah. you know, the other kids, the two oldest ones, Thomason and Caleb, were born in England. And these people did have some degree of lifestyle. Right. So odds are those first two kids were born via midwife. Yeah. The twins may be the same thing at the plantation. But I, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Yeah. How, who helped her? Right. Well, she probably did a lot of it by herself. And Thomason probably had to grow up pretty damn quick yeah. and help out with that too. So Samuel was born. And Catherine gives Thomas in charge of him. I guess she needed a little break, uh, wanted the baby to get some fresh air. Thomason takes the baby outside 
to basically keep him occupied for a bit. And then during a game of peekaboo, the baby just poof, vanishes. So, of course, Thomason panics and runs to the edge of the woods, but doesn't dare enter. They've been given all kinds of warnings about yeah. going into the woods. And Kate, in particular, is terrified yeah. of the woods. She Definitely. doesn't like the idea of going in at all. The next thing we see is a shadowy figure, and we hear a baby cooing. Mm -hmm. So someone or something took this kid. Next scene, the baby is with the Witch of the Woods. She approaches the child naked. We see her gnarly, decrepit hand caressing the baby, admiring his soft, new flesh, and then the blade comes into frame. Mm. Fortunately, we aren't shown what happens next, but we do see the aftermath. And this is where we get to talk about a little thing called flying, flying ointment. ointment. And ew, that's all yeah. I can say about this. It's such a gnarly concept, mm -hmm. but you made notes on it, so talk about it for a sec. <laughs> the flying ointment is a very old recipe. It's made in a variety of ways, but the chief binding agent, I guess you would call it, the delivery method, is fat, either of an unbaptized baby or children exhumed from graves, and also a variety of psychoactive herbs such as henbane, belladonna, hemlock, and wolfsbane. These would also be called deliriance, causing strange visions and right. feelings of flying. Mm -hmm. So they're all getting high on their own supply. Right. Yeah. Right. At least this it's, one. Yeah. Yeah. And I say this one, a little bit of a spoiler for later, but we're going to be spoiling the whole thing, folks. You're going to know how it ends and everything, too. But at least for her. Yeah. Because we see her then applying Ugh. the ointment. And, and, and you know, you know what's in it. Yeah. Because, I mean, thankfully, it was implied. Yeah. But we didn't get to see it or hear it or anything like that. We just see what the result was. And again, ew. <clears throat> yeah. So after the ritual is complete, we see the witch silhouetted in the full moon. And it looks, at least to me, it yeah. looks as though she's transforming. The silhouette takes on a distinct bird-like form. Probably the raven that we're going to see later. That's what I'm thinking is happening here. Or maybe this is just all part of her flying hallucination. Who knows? Yeah. Obviously, Catherine is devastated. She can't stop grieving. The kids are basically taking care of themselves, and there comes a point where Caleb, let's say he notices his sister Thomason in a very flowers in the attic sort of way. If you don't understand that reference, it means pretty much what you think it means. This, fortunately, isn't really explored very much further, but it will come up again. Yeah. And there are reasons for it. And since I'm talking about this now, I'm going to go on record with this, uh, with my opinion on this. Uh, was it incest? Well, I'm sorry, but who else was he going to look at? Yeah. You know, Caleb was a young boy on the cusp of puberty. Yeah. And there is his sister also on the cusp of puberty or maybe even having started it at this point. Yeah. There's talk about that aspect yes. of things with her. But the bottom line is... He looks at her. He knows that he likes what he sees. I'm certain he doesn't know precisely why it's turning him on. But I'm sorry. She was all that was there. And yeah. this is what happens yeah. when you've got somebody that age in isolation. Would I call it incest? No, I would just call it his hormones had no place else to go. Yeah. All, these kids are all extremely lonely. All they have is each other. Yeah. Yeah. And and Thomason should be with another family serving them. That it was that was tradition. Yes, and we'll get to that in a little yeah. bit. But you know, sometimes those decisions are made for not so great reasons, mm. especially the way that it's done in this little dialogue that we're gonna get to in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Back onto the timeline. William is now out in the cornrows, and oh my god, oh my god, the farm oh. that he has set up is fucking pathetic it's terrible the corn is just it's it doesn't look good <laughs> no it doesn't look edible no i don't think it is no they had not. to what they did um i listened to the director's commentary he said they had to buy the corn like six months earlier so that it would rot and look horrible yeah so, 
And this, it was supposed to be what this guy's hand could produce from the ground. And yeah, yeah, no, there's no possible way that anyone could live on it. I don't even think you could make flour out no. of it at that point. It was no. just that bad. But he's out there in the cornrows trying to clear some of the chaos from his head. And Caleb is out there with him. And he and Caleb have a conversation wherein William decides to call off the search for Samuel. Um, he assumes that a wolf took him while Thomason wasn't looking. And it's just such a nonsensical explanation yeah. for the whole thing. Yeah. Because I'm sorry, the kid would have cried. They wouldn't have disappeared. There's no wolf that's faster than a cheetah. Okay. Yeah, right. If a wolf took the kid, that was one fast motherfucking wolf. Yeah. And no, there's no, it was something else. And I think that he knows it, but he doesn't want to say it. Yeah. Because for all of his religiosity, he doesn't want to start talking about things like witches. No. No. Nope. And not in this climate mm -mm. and not in not at that time in uh, in colonial history. He certainly didn't want to start making assertions about that. So he decides, decides, just like most Christians decide to believe anything. Right. He decides that a wolf took the baby. He also decides to go into the woods for the purpose of finding food to hunt because he knows that there's no possible way that they're going to survive the winter with what they have on hand. The stores of their harvest are not going to last. So he's got to find some meat. So he goes out into the woods and he takes Caleb with him. And Caleb has his own superstitions about the woods, but his father is insistent that he comes along, trying to make a man out of him. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm. At home, Catherine is still delirious with grief and praying furiously. Thomason spies on her through a hole in the makeshift curtain around Catherine and William's bed, and it's not a pretty picture at no. all. Now, these people literally never stop talking about their religion. And William is insistent on imparting all kinds of Puritan dogma to Caleb by asking him questions and having him respond with answers he has memorized. And yes. you think there's a reason for this. Yeah, there's a reason because they used to teach their children, they used the New England primer, which was used from the 1600s until the early days of the 20th century. Amazing. Yes, this is where a good amount of the religious poetry and teachings in the movie are adapted from. This is also where the familiar prayer, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, comes from as well. And that's creepy as fuck. It is. It is. The primer was made to teach reading, but it also included a catechism as well as many prayers. The catechism questions are what William asks Caleb, and since the primer was used for rote learning, because... The Puritans didn't trust free speech. They wanted everything controlled really, really tightly. Oh, yeah. So the answers Caleb gives are all in the book under the chapter title or the section title, Spiritual Milk for American Babies. Oh, isn't that just syrupy sweet? Yeah. And creepy as fuck. Creepy. And oozing with child abuse. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, David Barton, the revisionist historian, had reprinted the book in the 1990s for homeschooling use. Wonderful. Of course he did. Didn't Haven't we talked about him before? Yeah. On this show a couple of times? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's terrible. Oh, yeah. No, and of course he would that's... think this book is just a perfect thing to teach children to read. Well, he would. Yeah, he, he would. would. Because, you know, like I said a minute ago... There's a lot that goes on in this movie that you could tie directly to evangelicalism. I'm stopping at a couple of points, but there are more that I could. Oh, yeah. We could spend a week. Yeah. And the cringe factor for me was high with this scene. Yes. Because it felt to me like it took so much of this kid's brain power yeah. to remember this stuff and recite it back. It's like, Jesus Christ, there's going to be no room left for anything practical. No. Because his head is so full of this shit that it's all he can think about. And we find out just how much he thinks about this. Because the next thing that happens is that Caleb asks if his brother was born with sin. And of course, William says yes. He also tells Caleb that Samuel was taken from them because, quote, he offended God's kingdom. Like, okay. How? Yeah, that's the question of the day, isn't it? How does an infant offend God's kingdom? But when I realized that one of my college professors actually believed that some babies go to hell 
based on their probability of accepting Christ given who their parents are. Right. You know, yeah. this kind of thinking doesn't really surprise me at all. It just confirms for me just how far back it goes. Can you imagine believing for one solitary second that an infant would go to hell if such a place existed? And there's more hypocrisy to come with this because, of course, William winds up doing the same thing that everybody does. And like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, where he starts applying loopholes. Right. So... Caleb then questions why Samuel disappeared. And of course, dad blames his family's lack of faith because that's what he does. He blames a lack of faith and having too much pride and all of that. These are the things that have brought all of this calamity on them. Well, he's kind of half right because the pride thing was an issue. Right. But Caleb starts contemplating his own mortality. And this is where William starts to backpedal. Um, He changes Mm -hmm. gears when it comes to his live son his firstborn son who is afraid of dying and going to hell. So he's going to smooth this over by telling Caleb, you are youngly yet. In other words, you know, it's the whole age of accountability thing. Right. Okay. If he's old enough to notice his sister in this way, he is definitely what we would have considered the age of accountability at oh, this definitely. point. So this is William trying to console him. You are youngly yet. So I'm sitting here thinking an infant offended God But this boy on the cusp of adolescence who likes to check out his sister's assets gets a hall pass. So, you know, it's just more of that. Let's believe what is appropriate for the situation. And people in general are really, really good at this. So the assertion here is that he's too young to be damned. Mm. But then there's all this talk and screaming aloud about how Samuel is in hell. Right. So because he was born with original sin, he wasn't baptized, yada, yada, yada. So there's all of this going on there, too. Right. Then Williams says something that I think is very Calvinist. He says, "'Tis God alone, not man, who knows who is the son of Abraham and who is not, who is good and who is evil." <laughs> He seems to forget the concept a little later, you know, as it applies to his daughter. Yeah. So, yeah, the predestination stuff did get in there a bit. It kind of wove its way into his thinking just enough for him to be able to pull it out when it matters. It's at this point that William discloses to Caleb that he traded Catherine's prized silver cup basically to buy hunting traps. But Catherine thinks that it's Thomason Mm -hmm. who is hoarding it away somewhere. We jump to Thomason gathering eggs, and she only finds one. It's more of a metaphor of just how bad things are for this family. Yeah. You got one egg for all these people. And behind the coop, she finds a broken shell with the dead embryo of a growing chick inside. Right. Really creepy, but they never really come back to it, so no. who knows what it actually means. I think it's just the lack. They're, they're showing you the lack, and they're yeah. also showing you the evil. Because, like... Every time you see a dead thing, yeah, that's not something that's pleasant. That's not something no. good. That's something evil. Yeah, it's that. It's pretty much right in line with what you're saying right. there. I was thinking maybe it was some kind of message from the witch, but mm. no, no, it's it's purely symbolic. <laughs> Later on, William is out in the woods, and he is the brave hunter now. He's going to come home with dinner, mm. and he spots a hare. And tries to shoot it, but of course the gun malfunctions. Was this because William was an inept idiot who didn't know how to shoot? Well, it's possible. Right. But there was very definitely something about that hair. Yeah. And it shows up more than once. Oh, definitely, yeah. William almost literally shoots his eye out. Yeah. Okay? It would have been more interesting if he had. Now we have one-eyed William. I think it would be just that much more creepy and in line with just how shit bad things are for this uh for this family at this point but here's where we get to meet black philip and here's where my note comes in handy we get to meet black philip who is a black goat i'm not sure what well, function he has he's the billy goat and the other goats are female yeah so he's the king he's the king of the hair okay so big black goat that the twins absolutely adore. And when I say they adore him, they basically worship him. Yeah. And this goes largely unnoticed. It seems like it's really far under the radar, even though they're running around 
and singing praises to this goat. The parents don't seem to catch on to this, like, at yeah. all. It's so odd. They literally do nothing about this. So Mercy and Jonas, these are the twins. They're fraternal twins, a boy and a girl. And they are sing, literally singing their praises to yes. this goat with these colorful and not at all creepy words of adoration. Yes. Black Philip, Black Philip, a crown grows out his head. Black Philip, Black Philip, to nanny queen is wed. Jump the fence post, running in the stall, Black Philip, Black Philip, king of all. And if that wasn't enough, there's a second stanza. Yeah. Black Philip, Black Philip, king of sky and land. Black Philip, Black Philip, king of sea and sand. We are your servants, we are your men. Black Philip eats the lions from the lion's den. And I'm just thinking to myself, boy, that is really a complicated song for two six-year-olds to make up. Yeah, but he taught it to them. That's the point. I'm pretty Almost. sure that yeah. he taught it to them. Yeah. But for me, it comes back to why does this not phase their parents? Yeah. They do literally nothing. You would think that if they're singing words like that, that William would have caught on, that he would have at least said something make them say extra prayers or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, there's definitely shit going down here that yeah. is not normal because no, no two six-year-olds should be able to conjure this out of their own minds. No. And, well, they didn't. No. And that's the point. Yeah. But here's the thing about their little praise fest here. It seems to be rousing Philip. And we don't know whether this is in a good way or a bad way, but he's not attacking them. I get the impression that he's really loving the moment. And then, you know, William has to step in and just destroy the whole thing. He wrangles him into his pen, and Philip goes very grudgingly back into captivity. Yeah. The twins think this is all a hoot. You know, I don't know what is going on with these children. It just doesn't seem like they it's not really... Natural understand or even have a notion of the world around them. Yeah. Nothing seems to bother them or phase them. Their brother has been gone less than a week and this is how they're behaving. They're not afraid of anything. They're not grieving. They don't miss their brother. It's just so odd. Yeah. There is something going on with those kids and maybe it's just that they've been bewitched by whatever Black Phillip happens to be so you had something in your notes about goats and where they kind of fit in here yeah the point is that they don't goats were obviously kept by the settlers and the colonists but they are not associated as much with new england witchcraft but it was much more prevalent in european folklore and in england where they were Emerson Baker, a history professor at Salem State University, co-hosted a packed screening of The Witch in Salem and considers himself among the film's biggest fans. It's just about the best depiction of early New England that I've seen in a movie. But he too said he didn't recall goats in North American lore or historical records. Still, he praised the movie's depiction of animal familiars, or creatures believed to be in the thrall of witches. There aren't a lot of direct goat antecedents, but pretty much any animal could be a witch's familiar. That's certainly an accurate notion, he said. One of the definitions of a witch is of a shapeshifter and the ability to put themselves into animal form. We see that repeatedly in the concept of black cats, or rats, or mice, dogs, you name it. Yeah, and... You know, I'm not sure if Black Philip was one of the witches, and that's another point that I'm going to make later. You know, yeah. why call it the witch? It was clearly witches, plural. Yeah. But there's a reason why I think it's called the witch. Um, whether or not Black Philip was a witch, or if he was a demon, or if he was Satan himself, is left up to interpretation. Yes. But by all accounts, if he wasn't Satan, then he was one of Satan's kind of right hand minions. Yeah. We're going to learn more about Black Philip as we go. But Catherine, at this point, is very upset that Caleb went into the woods with William and that Thomason wasn't watching the twins. You know, she's just like, what the fuck are you people doing? And Caleb comes up with a very ham-handed story 
about why they were in the woods in the first place. You see, for whatever reason, William doesn't really want her to know that he's going out there for this purpose, probably because he doesn't want to scare her. Yeah. So it's like, we need this meat. We need to go and hunt for our food because we're not going to be able to sustain ourselves through the winter on what we've got. And so Caleb's story is that he'd seen an apple tree and was trying to direct his father there to get apples because at least they'd have that to eat. They brought the gun, or so he said, in case they encountered the wolf who took Samuel. Because clearly it was a wolf that took Samuel and that wolf is still in the woods. Mm. They're sticking to that wolf theory like glue, but the real way the baby disappeared is probably going to be revealed later. William is doing literally everything that he can to hold it together at this point. And you can read that as he starts chopping cordwood. Yes. Because that's what he does to hold things together. Right. He just chops cordwood. He is in his happy place when he is chopping cordwood. So that's what he does whenever right. he has a free moment. Catherine is slowly going crazy and it is beginning to show. Yeah. So down by the brook, Thomason is doing the laundry. Caleb sneaks another look at his sister and is still clearly distressed. Thomason deals with the situation by consoling him in a very motherly sort of way by basically holding him to her bosom. Yeah. And this goes back to what I was thinking before. It's like, I know that he kind of likes what he sees with her, but I don't see him getting off on this. No. He seems comforted, but he doesn't seem turned on by it. No. And this is the last that we are going to really have this concept visited on us in the story except for a couple of words from his mother a little bit later on about the situation because apparently kate has uh, noticed this and she comes out with her opinion about it a little bit later and mercy won't shut up about the witch of the wood and she's got more of this i don't know if they were rhymes this time around but she was um running around with this whole i'm the witch of the wood clackety clack goes my broom on yes. the on the trees and blah 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 yeah i don't know what that was it's indistinct mostly because she's a child right but it's all stuff that would be in a puritan child's head about what witches are yeah but under most circumstances singing and chanting about it with this lighthearted attitude would never be tolerated. And I don't understand why William did, because I guarantee you she wasn't just doing this down by the river. No. Okay. So she keeps going on about the witch. And then she claims that she talks to black Philip and also that she's seen a witch in the wood. And it's weird. It's as if the twins have this emotional barrier that not only keeps them from grieving, but allows them to make light of this situation. It's like they should be terrified Yeah. They should be terrified, and they're not. And it's just so fucking weird. Yeah. Um, Mercy spends this entire scene joking about how her brother disappeared, joking about how her brother disappeared, and chiding her sister, going so far as to say that mother hates you. Yeah. And Thomason then chides her back, criticizing her for not helping with the laundry after leaving home by herself. She retorts with, Black Philip says I can do what I like. She then says she's seen the witch in her riding cloak and that she knows that's who took Samuel, but again, doesn't seem afraid. So to shut her up, this scares her. Yes. This is the thing that scares her. To shut her up, Thomason tells her that it was her. I am that very witch. And starts recounting details that reflect things that happen later. My question is, how did she get it all so right? Because... Maybe it was just artistic foreshadowing, or maybe there was more going on there. It's never delved into. So who knows where all of this detail came from. But some of the things that she talks about then show up later. Right. And they involve her. So Thomason keeps this up for a bit. And she keeps up the bit for just a little bit too long. She finishes things off by making Mercy swear not to tell their parents about the exchange, or she'll be cursed. And now all of a sudden, this little brat is afraid. Yeah. I'm, it took this. I, you know, everything that's happened up until now was, you know, no big deal. But her sister looming over her and telling her that she'll be cursed if she tells her parents what happened. 
that's the thing that uh, yeah. that scares her. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's yeah. nonsensical. I don't know what other words to tag onto it, but yeah. it's just plain weird. Yeah. Then we cut to the next scene. And more of that oh-so-happy prayer that we figure out is grace. Yeah. They're praying over their dinner. This is how this family prays over their dinner. Yep. Just listen to this shit. And forgive us the sins we have this day committed against thee. Free us from the shame and torment which are due unto us, Father. We beseech thee, increase our faith in the promise of the gospel, our fear of thy name, and the hatred of all our sins that we may be assured that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, that we might be thy children in thy love and mercy. But as we hunger for this food of our bodies, so our souls hungers for the food of eternal life. Finish soon our days of sin and bring us to eternal peace through the purifying blood of thy Son, our Lord and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. They're praying for death over their yeah. dinner. They're praying to die. As they're sitting down to eat their dinner. It's so fucked up. Yeah. I but mean, it's so nicely shot. This is one of my favorite scenes in the film because, yeah. oh my God, it's beautiful. It looks like a Renaissance painting. It kind of does. Yeah. It's just like the lighting and everything is perfect. And it's just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's let's like, let's pray to die and then eat. <laughs> yes. That's a lot. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, a it's, a, it's a way lot. So they're saying grace, and it's loaded with the same kind of self-loathing that defines William, basically. Mm. And uh, I'm sitting there thinking, Jesus, all this to say rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub? I also thought, you know, if Yahweh were real, if this God that they worship was real, he would literally be masturbating to these prayers. They're just the kind of sick, twisted shit that defines who and what this God is. He would be eating this up. That's more of that whole serendipitous Christians portraying their God the right way sort of situations. Yeah. And over time, we watch Catherine becoming more and more distant and less rational. Yeah. And right now she's deciding to be pissed off about the cup and a couple of other things. That night, Catherine actually questions Thomason about the disappearance of the cup and suspects her to be responsible for Samuel's disappearance, too. Catherine then says that something is amiss. Gee, you think? Mm. She says something not natural is going on here. Mm. William decides to placate her by calling for a family fast the following day to, quote, atone for their sins because that is what everything comes back to. If we all stop sinning, we'll just be happy. So tomorrow we won't eat. And we'll think about our sins. Mm. I get the impression that had things progressed a little bit further for this family, he would have had this idea a lot going forward. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes it would probably be um, it would probably be on purpose, and sometimes it would probably it would be just because there's nothing there to eat, or there's so little to eat that maybe we should skip a day here and there. Mm. You can already see that kind yeah. of heating up that's where their story was headed yeah. without all the supernatural stuff that's precisely where they were headed yeah so after all this for a second time we see a hare and this time it's rousing the livestock in the barn i'm pretty sure that this now when i alluded to it before i'm just going to say it now i'm pretty sure that this hare is the same witch who took the baby and who Caleb would, let's just say, encounter later. We'll get to that in a sec. But Catherine has also not been sleeping. And William blames himself for Samuel's death because, I mean, it's the convenient thing to do. Right. This is what he does. His entire thought life is centered on self-deprecation, but at the same time, he thinks that his shit doesn't stink when it comes to his religiosity. Right. William tells Catherine that, quote, God has taken us into a very low condition to humble us. And boy, didn't we hear that one yeah. a lot, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God is trying to teach you something by you being completely inept and not able to provide for your family. Okay, got it. And then Catherine comes right out and says it. She says, we shouldn't have left. And she's right. Yeah. She's so right. The children then overhear their parents discussing sending Thomason away to serve another family. 
And in the context of the conversation, it almost sounds punitive, but in the context of the culture, it really wasn't. Right. It was usually a means of ensuring that a young girl grew up and eventually made babies if her family was too poor or otherwise unable to raise her through puberty. In this case, they also think it might fix her, I think. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's in the back of their minds. But Kate protests pretty vehemently, which then brings the conversation back around to Samuel. You see, she's she really is on the cusp of crazy and insane. Yeah. Because there's the part of her that resents her daughter. And then there's the part of her that doesn't want to part with another one of her kids. Yeah. See, there's that. So she's got this inner conflict going on because as we'll learn later, she has some strong opinions about Thomason. Yeah. And they're not really good ones. But at this point in time, it's just like, look, can I just not lose another child at this point? And that's what she's yeah. thinking of, I think. And those thoughts, I think, give birth to the next part of the conversation wherein she is wailing that their son is in hell, which is really a sick, sad way of thinking about the fate of a baby. Yeah. But because of all the dogma that they've swallowed, and because this child hadn't been baptized, yeah. then this is what must be happening to him right now. It's so sick and twisted. Yeah. So as a means of trying to, you know, kind of smooth the situation over a little bit, William says that the next day he's going to go into the village with Thomason and promises Catherine that they will find food. He also intends to talk with a couple of families he knows about sending Thomason to serve them. He mentions them by name in the right. previous scene yeah. as possible families for her to go to. So it's not even a secret at this yeah. point. Or, well, I guess it was supposed to be because you, did you notice how she calls out all the kids to see if everybody's sleeping? Yeah. And none of them are, but none of them are answering because they're too interested in what's going to happen next. Yeah. So they're all listening and Thomason hears this too. So really not good vibes at yeah. this point. But again, this wasn't culturally punitive. Situationally perhaps, but not culturally. Right. At least that's what, how Thomason was clearly taking it. Um, the weird part is that the character in this who acts the craziest, and I think that's, that's Catherine, the character who acts the craziest in this is the one who has the most rational thoughts out of yeah. all of these people. She knows how bad things are. She wants to go back to the plantation, but William is so intent on not going back to that church that he is ostensibly choosing hardship and possible starvation in this wilderness so swallowing just a little bit of that prideful conceit yeah. and going back where there's a little bit of security because, you know, these people were fed up with them, but I think that the people that came back would have been people who had kind of learned their lesson and it would have been understood and accepted. Yeah. And, you know, if I had to choose between dying and going back to these people I buttered horns with hat in hand, um, here's my hat. You know, that's that's the way I look at it at that point. Later, though, Thomason finds Caleb preparing to check a trap in the forest and forces him to take her with him by threatening to awaken their parents if he doesn't. And this is where they have their conversation about oh, England. Okay. So we learn what their lifestyle was a little bit more. We don't get a lot of details, no. but we know that it was better. We know that they had yeah. a, a firm roof over their heads and that they had some creature comforts. We yeah. know this based on the conversation that they have in this scene. And it's sad to think about what they've lost and what they've sacrificed. So Thomason and Caleb were having this, this heartfelt stroll down memory lane. And in the yeah. woods, they spot the hare again. And this time it sends their horse into a panic. And their dog Fowler goes after the hare. He gives chase into the woods and then Caleb goes after him. Bert, that's the horse, throws Thomason, knocking her unconscious, and then runs away. But Caleb then becomes lost in the woods and starts consoling himself the only way he knows how right. by reciting prayers. And then he hears Fowler yelping. And at that point, we cut back to Thomason, who comes to and hears her father calling out to Caleb. Caleb then stumbles upon Fowler's disemboweled body. Oh. Yeah. It was. It's too late for the dog. That's a wrap on the dog, folks. 
He then discovers a hovel from which a beautiful woman emerges to seduce him. Mm. And that is basically what happens here. But then as she puts her arm around him, you see what I think is the same old decrepit arm that we saw touch the baby earlier. Yes. And she grabs him, pulls him close, and kisses him. Fortunately, again, we don't get the gory details here. William goes into the woods trying to find Caleb despite major protests from Catherine. And she is rightly not in the mood to lose anyone else at this point because now it's looking like Caleb might be missing. They found Thomason, but, you know, Caleb is probably not coming home at this point. But before William goes into the woods, I guess he decided that, you know, I may not be coming back here. So maybe I should tell her about the cup. So he admits it. He admits taking Catherine's silver cup mm. and selling it and asks both Kate and Thomason to forgive him. Yeah. Basically, he thinks he's going to die. And he doesn't want to go with this on his conscience and who can blame him. He also wants to protect Thomason from her mother's wrath which is a nice gesture considering that he's already thrown her under the bus at least once over this by staying silent when mom was accusing her. Yeah. Then he also admits to taking Caleb into the woods, which makes Kate angrier. And she blames William for now losing two of her children. Mm. Later that night, as a storm rages, Thomason discovers Caleb outside the home He's naked, delirious, and mysteriously ill with one of these cinematic kind of illnesses that no one quite understands. Since they have no idea what's wrong with him, they do the most logical thing they can think of, and they bleed him. Because bloodletting was supposed to have both medical and spiritual benefits. So I guess they figured they were killing two birds with one stone and would hopefully be saving their kid. The next day, the twins, after all of this drama, after all of this drama, what are the kids doing the next day? The twins are outside, and they're singing songs with Black Phillip, and they're accusing Thomason of witchcraft, but it's all so light and airy and impish in the way that they're, they're dealing with this. And again, they're not scared. Their brother is really, really sick. And the way that he arrived home, you know what? That was that was fucking scary for anybody. Yeah. But these kids, oh, they got that force field up. They yeah. aren't affected by this at all. And in the midst of them singing and cavorting and and lauding Black Philip again, Thomason attempts to milk one of the other goats and gets nothing but blood instead yeah. of milk. And all the while, there's Black Philip just sort of looking on as if overseeing the whole thing and just taking it all in. So you had something about this that you wanted to Um, interject. Cow's udders bleeding was a common accusation in witch hunts, as well as hens not laying, milk spoiling, and preventing the formation of butter. And, you know, a lot of those things do kind of make their way into the storyline here. So that's very, very interesting. So after all this, Mercy then tells Thomason that Black Phillip said Thomason was evil and that she had witched her brother. Catherine is now convinced that Caleb is bewitched, but William, in his infinite wisdom, dismisses the notion outright. He then concedes to go back to the plantation, and his plans have failure written all over them. It's too late. They've lost everything. The horse ran away. Right. They have nothing. They don't even have a horse to ride back to the plantation. So this is a plan where many, many, many things can go wrong. But, you know, it's the last resort that they should have thought about a few months ago and should have discussed a little bit more in depth and a little bit more in earnest a while ago. But now all of a sudden... It's a priority. They're going to try and do this. And William is all, we can do it. And Kate's like, but how? You know, again, being the only rational one, the craziest one in the bunch, but also the most rational one out of all of them. And, you know, maybe that's not fair. Maybe not the craziest, but she's definitely on William's level at this point. They're going crazy together at this point. 
they're kind of like, I guess, the Jack and Wendy of the story at this point, where oh, yeah. first he starts going, and then she starts going, and you know the whole isolation aspect of it. There is that. William then asks Kate what she wants, and she says at this, and this is the point where she says that she wants to go home, and he's like, "Well, we're going home. We're going back to the plantation," and she's like, "No, no, no not there. I want to go back to England." And just the sheer impossibility of it. There's no way. There's no right. way that they could ever get back there. No. And even as she says it, she knows it, which just makes the whole situation that much worse. Um, and yeah, at that moment in time, things have gone from bad to worse. And she wants normalcy. And who wouldn't in that situation? Oh, that is what she wants, is to feel normal again. Even after all that she's lost, she feels like, she could kind of rebuild herself from the inside out if she was back in familiar surroundings, if she had the life that she knew back, that it would somehow make all of this okay yeah. or worth it if she could get back there. But it's not going to happen, and she knows. And, of course, now she feels guilty about wanting this and compares herself yeah. to Job's wife being disobedient and lacking in faith, telling her husband to curse God and die over the calamity that they've been through which she doesn't outright say to him, right. but the sentiment is there. Mm -hmm. She might not be literally telling William to curse God, but she is asking him to swallow his pride, which really isn't something that's going to happen anytime soon, and she knows that too. Catherine then recounts a dream that she had where she was about Thomason's age, and she says that she was with Jesus and was, quote, so ravaged with his love toward me, I thought it far exceeding the affection of the kindest husband. She then says, and since Samuel disappeared, I have such a sad weakness of faith, I cannot shake it. I cannot see Christ's help as near. I pray and I pray, but I cannot. I fear I cannot ever feel that same measure of love again. And boy, oh boy, hasn't anyone who has walked away from this thing called evangelicalism felt that way at one oh, point yeah, or another. Geez. And the first time it happened to me, it was painful and horrible and awful. And I didn't know what I was going to do with myself mm -hmm. when it happened for the last time. And I walked away from that church knowing that I was walking away from the last time. It was relief. Yeah. But the but the fear that's associated with it here is very, very real. And it's just more of the despair that she feels. She knows that everything is turning to shit and she's starting to understand that God doesn't care. Yeah. And that's one of the worst feelings. I think when you start understanding the truth behind the fairy tales, that's the worst part of it yeah. is the notion that there's really nothing or no one there who cares. And now you're kind of on your own. For those of us who come out of evangelical Christianity, we do our best to find other people and find other things that we can use to fill a lot of those voids. How do you do that when it's just you and your batshit family yeah. out in the middle of nowhere? And then uh, William says something that's utterly brilliant and also something that we're told a lot yeah. about when we're going through really horrible circumstances. William tells her things are going to be a lot better when we get to heaven. Well, so now, wonderful. Yeah, is, isn't it, though? We have to actually wait until we die. But the good news is it's probably not going to be long. So, <laughs> oh. you know, we'll feel better soon. Ugh. Oh, God, it's just it makes my skin crawl just yeah. to think about how many times I heard this sentiment coming from other people. It's not just for the Puritans. You know, no. these are sentiments that I have heard and have also had aimed at me in my lifetime. And Catherine is and i can relate to this so so much she is having a crisis of faith obviously that's where those words are coming from this is the most rational thing yeah. about her it's the most rational thought that she is going to have through this entire thing is that god doesn't fucking care and yeah. she's right but it's that more than anything that drives her crazy too because again in isolation with right. nothing to do about this then that's what happens to you. You just, you, you sink into yourself and you just start going slowly crazy. Obviously, she was unhappy before. Right. Now she's just pissed and she's starting to understand just how absent God is in all of this. But on the heels of that, 
what do we get? More pagan goat worship from Mercy. That's so weird. And this one is even better. Yeah. Black Philip is a merry, merry king. He rules the land with mirth. Black Philip has a mighty, mighty sting. He'll knock thee to the earth. Sing ba ba, King Philip the Black. Sing ba 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 ba. Sing ba ba, King Philip the Black. He'll knock thee on thy back. Isn't that just warm and cozy? Yes. And the type of thing that you would hear from a six year old. Oh, and again, and again, like no response from anyone. No one is phased by this. No one is appalled by it. It's as if it's not really happening. Yeah, I know. It's very odd. It feels like it's happening in its own bubble and literally no one else is noticing. But what they do care about is when Caleb awakens screaming and suddenly remembering everything that was done to him. It's implied that the witch did things to subdue him and then possibly possibly raped him judging by the language that he uses and the way that he describes what happened to him he at one point says she's upon me she kneels my bowels my stomach she pinches sin 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 so who knows what she was doing to him but i know what it looks like in my head Mm -hmm. so you can take that any way you want and interpret it any way you want i'm reasonably certain of what happened there and why she chose to do it the way that she did it. And then, you know, they they were talking about apples. In the scene where Thomason and Caleb are doing the reminiscing, she also brings up to him that she knew that there was no way that they were going out to find apples because they hadn't seen an apple since they left England. Well, mm-hmm. they're about to see one because he's about to vomit one up that has just a single bite taken out of it. Yeah. And that's what happens. And it's at that point that Catherine says it right out loud, that Caleb is witched. Mercy then accuses Thomason right in front of her parents and provides some very vivid details, accounting mostly what happened at the brook. Right. And using that as proof that her sister is actually the one responsible for all of this. And William, of course, is starting to take this a little bit more seriously. And he makes Thomason make a confession of faith and then declares that he raised up no witch in his house. So uh, William goes full, not my kid on this one. But it's in the back of his mind. And he keeps vacillating between maybe, nah, maybe not. Yeah, I think so. But no, this is <laughs> this is his mind at yeah. this point. This is what's going on. And then he comes up with the same solution that you're going to get from your average Christian counselor. Let us pray and we shall fear nothing. So he starts leading the family in prayer and the kids forget the words to their prayers. This is, in my opinion, a throwback to something in the Salem witch trials. Yes, I'm pretty sure that there was testimony in one of those trials where the kids claimed that their memories were wiped clean of their prayers by one of the quote unquote witches in Salem. So the kids forget their prayers. They start writhing on the floor and yelling, stop it, Thomason, again, back to the Salem witch trials with with the um, affected girls doing all kinds of crazy shit, especially in court. Right. If things didn't seem like they were going the way that they wanted, they would start doing stuff like this. And that's what the twins are doing. They're acting out so that they can put the blame on Thomason. And it goes right back to the whole notion of spectral evidence. So uh, I hope we don't lose power in the middle of this. The lights just flickered where we are. And I just thought that it was timely and weird. So hopefully we get through this because I know my laptop won't. It it desperately needs a new battery. Yeah. going to maybe take some of that awesome Patreon money and fix up the Mac just a little bit soon here. But we're kind of depending on the power staying on for just a little while longer because I really want to get to the end of this story. So in the midst of all of this, Caleb then breaks in with more delirious rantings and he's recounting more of what he's seen. And I find this part of it very interesting. He says, it's her, a cat, a crow, a raven, a great black dog, a wolf. She desires my blood. She sends her devils. And then Thomason, William, and Catherine join hands and start quoting Psalm 23. They've got their hands joined around him 
mm-hmm. you know, kind of to make a protective circle. Yeah. 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 Let's think about that for a sec. <laughs> so they've got hands joined around him and they are reciting Psalm 23 as a means of exercising Caleb. And it seems to work. He comes to and joins in with, for thou art with me. So now they're thinking that they've delivered him. So they stop praying. But it's not over yet. Because now we get to hear Caleb's death prayer, which I'm not going to read in its entirety. But oh my God, is this like overwrought. And weird. It's very, very weird. Yes. Very weird. Very over the top. And... You know, if it was written in iambic pentameter, it could be one of the last scenes in a Shakespeare tragedy. That's how overdone this is. But I found this part very, very interesting and very on purpose. Part of his prayer is, kiss me with the kisses of thy mouth, my Lord, my love, my soul's salvation. You know where that comes from? The Song of Solomon. Easily the lustiest book in the Bible. Yeah. So that whole concept is drawn back to this kid while he's laying on his deathbed. And his prayer is then followed by this delirious laughter that almost to, you know, to me anyway, looks and sounds practically orgasmic. Yeah. He is in the throes of some kind of ecstasy at this moment, this last moment of his life. He is experiencing this ecstasy. And with a sated grin, then a dark emptiness across his face, Caleb, now free of the clutches of his captor, abruptly dies. Yeah. Of course, Catherine becomes convinced that Thomason is a witch at this point. William tries to console Thomason and reminisces with her about better days at the homestead. He's got her out of mom's presence and just trying to have a sane conversation with her and trying to convince her and probably himself that he doesn't believe any of that, that she's not a witch and all of this. But he is kind of convinced at this point. He's kind of in this denial mode where he's giving her lip service, but it's in his mind that this is true. He doesn't want it to be true, but it's in his mind that it's true. But the problem is that he still loves her. He urges her to break her deal with the devil and tells her that it's okay, regardless of what he's told you, you can break your deal with him and Christ will forgive you and there's safety in Christ and all of this. Then he asks her directly. He looks her in the eye and says, as I love thee, speak the truth. Basically, he's saying, I want to help you, but I can't unless you tell the truth and admit what you've done and what you are. So he doesn't want it to be true. But he's erring on the side of caution here and saying, well, if it's true, I can still redeem her. I can still save her. And that's what he's trying to do. But Thomason, let's just say that she gets a little offended and with good reason. And she comes back with the 1600s equivalent of, okay, you want the truth? Here it comes. And she starts going through this litany of flaws and things that she has noticed about her father and certain things that have happened since they established the quote-unquote farm. She says, you were going to send me away. I heard. Oh, and you let my mother think I took her cup. She then calls her father basically again in Puritan terms a shitty farmer and then literally, well, almost literally calls him useless. She says, thou canst do nothing save cut wood. And she's right. Yeah. So at that point, William takes on the form of the manly man, okay? And he's starting to get very, very angry. Thomason calls her father a hypocrite over his lies, his half-truths, and deceptions, and slaps him with, you know, again, the Puritan equivalent of, how's that for the truth? William then, of course, he's apoplectic with rage at this point. Yeah. And he calls, literally calls his daughter, who he was trying so hard to maintain his faith in, a minute ago, a bitch. Um, things aren't looking good here at yeah. all. Thomason asks Dad why he seems so unfazed by the way the twins seem to speak and consort with Black Phillip. So not that much of a bubble. She sees it, but she's not saying anything. Yeah. Obviously, she's seeing it, but not drawing attention. So we find out here that she's been privy to it all along and wants to know why dad is doing nothing about it. 
so then she comes right out with it. And she says, the adversary comes in the shape of a he-goat and whispers. He is Lucifer. "'Twas the twins and that goat what bewitched this whole farm. She then implicates Mercy by recounting Mercy's rantings at the brook about being the witch of the wood. She accuses the twins of making a compact with the devil through Black Philip. I almost said it, eh. but caught it. She makes a compact with the devil through Black Philip and refers to it as an unholy bond. And, of course, William buys it. <laughs> because, yeah. I mean, I've never seen... For, for somebody who wouldn't be shaken by the people in the plantation and their opinions on religion. He certainly is rather impressionable when it comes to stories his kids tell. Yeah. He seems to have this force field up to other religious opinions. But when his kids start accusing each other of witchcraft, all of a sudden, the twins say it's Thomason, so he decides it's Thomason. Then Thomason says that it's the twins, so he decides that it's the twins. And... He has a real fuck it moment after this. Yeah. Um, William brings Thomason before Catherine, who basically says that she wants Thomason out of the house. But William, now convinced that it's Mercy who's responsible for all of this, you know, you don't like the weather, wait a minute. Yeah. Um, he begs Kate to listen. He swears that Thomason isn't a witch, and Thomason again recounts her theory about the twins and Black Philip to her mother. William, at this point, is clearly losing it. He's going full Jack Torrance at this yeah. point, okay? Yeah. And is vacillating between wanting to believe that Thomason is innocent and his growing fear that it's too late and that the devil has a foothold over his entire family now. So William calls Thomason a creature and threatens to kill the children. Now we're done vacillating. He's gone full fuck it and saying, they're all bewitched. So here's how we're going to deal with it. He says, and the first thing he says is that he'll sacrifice Jonas like Abraham did Isaac. But here's the problem. That didn't actually happen. Maybe right. you should read the entire book. Mm. Uh, he basically puts the kids in prison at that point by boarding them up in a corner of the barn and telling them that in the morning he will set them loose and they'll start back to the plantation to seek help. He then tells them to think on their sins because that's what he does. Mm. Thomason begs to not be locked in there with Black Phillip. She's terrified of him. Yeah. Because, again, she's known all along. She just hasn't said anything. And you had something about this, too. Yeah. I found an essay about children in the Salem witch trials and how how they were accused. And most of them were daughters of mothers who have already been convicted, in some ways hanged. Yep. Here's a quote from that. It was easy to convince children of their inherent wickedness and to also coax confessions from them. An important point to bear in mind in examining the witchcraft cases of young children is that the notion of a child as a witch did not contradict Puritan belief. Particularly in the unusual case of Salem, witches and children alike were seen as easily influenced and potential or existing conduits for the devil. That's just so sick. <laughs> it's yeah. so sick, but not surprising. Yeah. Puritan children were often viewed as religiously precocious by the adults around them. Children were surrounded by deep and pervasive religious belief from the time of their births. For this reason, adults assumed a fairly high level of theological understanding in children at a very young age. In fact, Puritan practice may have made children more likely than adults in some ways to actually believe they were witches. The historian Judith Graham notes that Puritan girls and boys grew up in a culture that relentlessly required them to confront their sinfulness and to contemplate the possibility of being separated from the regenerate and condemned to the palpable horrors of hell. And you know what? I'm sitting here thinking to myself, what parts of this do I zero in on? and comment on them. But you know what? If you've spent five minutes in evangelicalism, yeah. especially as a child, you already know what's going on here. Yeah. I mean, I think back to that kid in Jesus camp. I got saved when I was five years old because I wanted more out of life. And how yeah. many kids did I know, especially going up to Word of Life, who got, quote unquote, saved even earlier, two, three, and four years old, 
this is why right here because yeah. you can get a kid to believe anything and i also started thinking about the mcmartin preschool yeah that was one of the huge things during the satanic panic and how they managed to get these kids to believe all this crazy shit happened and it never happened this is how this is it in a nutshell what you just read that's the reason why yeah and kids are an easy target it's sad that people think that it's okay to weaponize whatever they want to indoctrinate kids with and just shove this shit into their heads. But as we're seeing, it's not contemporary. No. This is something that religion in particular has done to children for a very, very long time. It's also, to me, another example of the bondage that keeps people coming back to the altar again and again and again. Yeah. You know, just a lot of the prayers that these people pray, they're just fraught with sentiment that, you know, gee, I don't know if I was saved the last time I asked. So I'm going to ask again, just so that we're completely abundantly clear. I don't want to go to hell and I want to follow Jesus. And this is what they teach us to do perpetually. You know, any time that we find ourselves in a quote unquote backslidden condition, we have to rededicate and that's a lot of what's going on in this part of the story, too. Just like the kids, we find ourselves boarded up in those corners a lot under the influence of parents, pastors, sometimes our peers. Yeah. And we need Jesus to set us free again. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely what I thought about when I saw these kids being boarded up in the corner of that barn. Thomason is pretty scared, but she kind of brings it down a few notches. Yeah. It almost seems like there's a normal conversation going on here between her and the twins. Thomason asks the twins if they are witches. The twins ask her, and it's understood that no one in that group is a witch. I think at that point, everyone just agrees to not discuss the matter further, and no one believes that anyone in that pen yeah. is a witch. So now there's this little spark of realism that is about to get eclipsed again. But yeah, this is one of those brief moments of clarity yeah. where they start understanding how crazy this has all gotten. What they don't bother to answer is when Thomason asks them if they really talk to Black Phillip. Yeah. And they don't answer that question. I think that they're honest with each other about whether or not they're witches. I think that that's discussed. It's an asked and answered sort of thing. But then the whole thing with Black Phillip, no, there is there is no answer forthcoming about that. Yeah. So then we see William and Kate burying Caleb. And Kate crawls into the grave for one last embrace with her dead son's body. William then does what William does and goes and chops more cordwood, you know, for the homestead. That they're supposedly leaving in the morning. Then he says this, this is my fault. I confess it. I am infected with the filth of pride. Dispose of me all thou wilt. Lord, redeem my children. They cannot tame their natural evil. Wow. Isn't that a great way of thinking about your kids? Even in beseeching God to save his children, his mind is so addled by his baseless beliefs, the thought suddenly turns away from how he fucked up to basically how God fucked up and gave them original sin. So now it's God who's to blame for all of this. So I guess he and Catherine are sort of getting back on the same page with this whole God thing, but not really because, I mean, what else does this guy know? He doesn't know what. No, he doesn't. This is all he knows. This is all that's going on in his brain 24-7, 365. This is it. So he may be angry at God, but he's not about to do what Job's wife recommended and curse God and die. He's not there yet. But now we get more self-deprecation from William. He calls himself a coward and an enemy of God and a bunch of other stuff, all trying to placate this deity who is apparently watching all this, but somehow just doesn't want to get involved. And he's wailing and crying out, I beg thee, save my children. And there's Thomason watching all this through the gaps in the boards that she's bound up in. Right. And William has no clue yeah. that he's being watched. Catherine then 
awakens to a delirious vision of Caleb holding Samuel. And she's thinking that they've both returned and she wants to tell William, but Caleb tells her not to, to let him sleep. Caleb then assures his mother that they will be with her often and references a book that he wants her to look at. Mm. Catherine is more concerned at this point with nursing a hungry Samuel, but what she doesn't realize at that moment is that it's actually a raven pecking at her breast and it leaves her bloody in the morning. Mm. William leaves the house in the morning and looks at something in the yard. We can't see what he's looking at, but he's kind of taken with it and he seems afraid. The children are no longer boarded up. The twins are gone. The livestock are all dead and Thomason is lying unconscious or maybe just deep asleep. But the instant that she wakes, Black Philip attacks a distracted William, impaling him in the ribs with his horn. And more of this Shakespearean tragedy ending and tragedy kind of dialogue. William cries out, corruption now art my father. And then Black Philip strikes a second time, impaling him again and burying him, ironically, under the woodpile. Then we see Thomason clutching the clothes once worn by her siblings. She's disoriented and in shock from what she's been witnessing. And she saw a lot. Yeah. Catherine then comes outside and just sees this Shakespearean tragedy going on around her. And this is where she goes nuts. She accuses Thomason again. Thomason has literally been caught red-handed, but maintains that it wasn't her. And it wasn't her. Right. She didn't do anything. And as her mother is wrestling her to the ground, she's screaming she came from the sky, talking about what happened to the twins. So now we know that the twins were taken. Yeah. And that's probably the same way that Samuel was taken because one thing that she didn't do at that moment was look up. She looked down at the empty blanket. She looked to the woods. We never see anything going on up above. Mm. So that's probably what happened and why he was able to disappear so quickly. Then now here it comes. Here comes the real truth, the real sentiment. Everything's going to get laid out on the table. Catherine calls Thomason a slut and a whore and accuses her of tempting Caleb. She then accuses her of wanting to fuck her own father, which escalates to accusations that she killed everyone. Samuel, Caleb, the twins, her father. She's responsible for all of it. So Catherine drags Thomason to the ground and calls her a witch. Thomason grabs a knife and slashes her mother to get her to yield. I don't think she ever wanted to kill her. No. But, you know, it works for a split second. It's almost like she comes to her senses for a split second, understanding what happened to her, but it just makes her angrier. And Catherine attempts to strangle Thomason, and that's when Thomason kills her with the knife. And with that, Thomason is basically alone. She's laying there with the dead body of her mother on top of her for a while. But after a little bit, she starts looking out into the woods with this real sense of foreboding she's alone now but not really mm -mm. because here's where it all comes together she's laying there exhausted with her mother on top of her and after a while she goes inside she undresses down to her shift and slumps over a table shift is just a undergarment yes a basic undergarment that they used to wear which is where the line comes from in just a minute when she wakes up it's dark so she's had a day. Most of this stuff happened in the morning. It's clearly now night. And when she wakes up, she lights a lantern and heads to the barn and literally stands there and asks Black Philip to speak to her. I conjure thee to speak to me. And well, he answers. The twins weren't lying. And he says in that breathy, almost Albus Dumbledore kind of voice, which kind of freaked me out a little bit the first time I heard it, <laughs> yeah. because it really sounded like Dumbledore to me. He says, what dost thou want? And she says, what canst thou give? And he says, wouldst thou like the taste of butter, a pretty dress? Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? And of course she says, yes, because after all of this, who the fuck wouldn't want to yeah. live deliciously? Yeah. Really? After all the shit that she had been through, of course, it was a quick and just immediate yes. He says, wouldst thou like to see the world? And to that she answers, what will you from me? He says, dost thou see the book before thee? Remove thy shift. 
so he basically tells her to get naked and she does and she says i cannot write my name he says i will guide thy hand so by all accounts we don't see it happen but it sure does look like she signed the book and then it's into the woods Naked and with Black Philip guiding her onward, Thomason then happens upon a particularly sinister and very Puritan picture of a witch's circle. This wasn't the happy, you know, good energy sort of thing that we used no. to see in Wicca. Not at all. There's mayhem going on here, okay? Yeah. They're loud. They're aggressive. They're wild, almost feral and stark naked, just like her. Thomason then feels the same kind of orgasmic elation that we saw in Kayla, but this is different. Right. It has a much, much different aspect to it. She rises off the ground and flies high into the air and then silence. That's where it ends. That is where the movie ends. Yeah. So basically the message here is that she decides she wants to be a witch and she becomes a witch and she joins this coven. And then this is where we find out for certain that there was more than one witch involved with a lot of this stuff. Right. Or maybe not so much that there were other witches involved, but just that there were other witches. I'm right. willing to believe that it was one witch mm -hmm. that was responsible for all of the calamity that came down on the family and, of course, Black Phillip. But ironically to me, the scariest part of this entire movie comes after the credits start to roll. After Robert Eggers takes his writer-director bow, we see this. Quote, This film was inspired by many folk tales, fairy tales, and written accounts of historical witchcraft, including journals, diaries, and court records. Much of the dialogue comes directly from these period sources, as we've demonstrated a little bit tonight. Right. So here's why I say it's the scariest part of the movie. This wasn't a true story. But it was an amalgam of a lot of true stories. That, to me, is terrifying. Just how much of this hysteria there actually was. Okay, right. not true to the extent that there were witches, but true to the extent that people believed that there were witches. Right. And that there were enough details to put together this one story that kind of tells them all. Yeah. I have to wonder why Salem was the only major mass witch hysteria and there were others yeah smaller but there were others but i have to wonder why salem was the only one that exploded into the thing that it was when i look at just how much they had to draw from to create the script for this movie it's like it's truly terrifying what was going on pretty much in our backyard um about 300 years ago it really is it, it's something to think about so the question that I had the first several times I watched this movie, the question that I had was what actually happened here? Did a witch terrorize the family or did the entire family go full Jack Torrance in isolation or maybe succumb to ergot poisoning, yeah. something that was making them hallucinate or whatever? But I do think that the answer here is clear because, like I said last week, you got to look at this from the perspective of someone living in the 17th century right. and not someone analyzing a movie in 2016, okay? In their world, the witch was real. So again, think of it like a Puritan. They believed this shit with every fiber of their being. Yes. It wasn't a hallucination or metaphor for anything. An actual witch took the baby. An actual witch seduced Caleb and so on. But that family was doomed long before that baby disappeared. With or without witches thrown into the mix, they were doomed. So that right there is what I think is a pretty thorough summary of The Witch. And if you still haven't seen the movie, you're going to approach it with a lot more understanding than I did the first time I saw it. And if you have seen it, I hope that you enjoyed our perspective on this because I went from someone who came home from the theater in 2016 basically saying, or 15 or whenever it was, saying, okay, so that basically accounted for an hour and a half of my life that I'll never get back. <laughs> and then I watched it again. And I took the advice of a few people on social media right. that I had gotten into conversations with about it. And they said, well, the problem is that you walked into that theater and watched it as someone watching a movie in the 21st century. Go back and watch it like you're a Puritan and tell me how bad it is. And they're right. They were yeah. very right. So that's what I did. And the second time through, boom, it all just hit me like a ton of bricks. So before I give you my final thoughts on this, just want to let you know 
that next week we are going to be talking about energy healing. I'm finally going to do the entire episode on things like Reiki and Shambhala and other things that we were exposed to both before and after we were evangelicals. Yeah. Because whether they like to admit it or not, energy healing is a big part of the evangelical experience. Mm -hmm. So we're going to dive into both ends of it, the evangelical end and the, what's the word I'm looking for here? The more metaphysical yeah. end of it that exists outside of evangelicalism. So we hope that you'll come back for that and that you'll enjoy it. And also next up on Unbound at the Movies, we're probably going to do this at the end of November since we've started a precedent of the last Sunday of the month being mm -hmm. set aside for this. The next movie that we're going to look at is Dogma. And we're going okay. to and we're going to be looking at that right around Thanksgiving, maybe toward the beginning of December. We're going to bring you an episode for pretty much our second anniversary with this show. We're going to bring you our analysis of something that's a little bit lighter, but still has a lot of meat to it. And that's the movie Dogma from Kevin Smith. So with all of that in mind, I just want to leave you with a few parting thoughts on the movie The Witch. I personally don't think that Robert Eggers was trying to convey a moral with this movie or anything else. There's no religious message here, good, bad, or indifferent. In fact, I don't think there's a platform of any kind being established here beyond showing just how much hysteria there really was over this stuff and that it started before and extended far further from Salem than most people realize. I think that's one of this movie's biggest contributions is that it made more people aware this wasn't just a thing that happened over the course of about a year in one town. This kind of shit was happening all over New England right. and probably in other places too. The movie isn't even trying to tout the dangers of religious extremism, really. All it seems to be saying here is that if you act like an asshole, people won't like you and bad things are likely to come your way. That's Life 101 as far as I'm concerned. Right. Everything that happens to the family after they leave the plantation is happenstance with a possibly purposeful targeting of Thomason as the next member of the coven. But if they hadn't made their farm where they did, I doubt Thomason would have even been on Black Phillip's radar. The Witch is a story designed to entertain, so I won't even make any more detailed evangelical connections, even though there are a few parts here that would take very, very well to it because, let's face it, evangelicalism is rather puritanical. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's all based on true events brings me right back to the same thoughts I had when we did our episode on Salem last year. We've had 300 years to curb religious extremism and develop a much better, more sane, secular society, but as humans, we have a tendency to learn slowly, and our refusal to learn has consequences. In the modern world, we don't press people between rocks or hang dogs who give us the evil eye anymore, but we do let things like the satanic panic happen. We do let shyster exorcists fleece the weak-minded and perpetuate mental illness. And some of us have, some of us have in our pasts rubbed people the wrong way and even alienated them by being legalistic assholes. Mm -hmm. If I had to come up with a moral here, it would be this. You have a lot to lose when you start loving your religion more than your own family, your own intellect, and yourself. That, in my opinion, was William. He happily walked away from a thriving community to chop cordwood while his family starved in the name of the, quote, true gospel. Kind of like ditching the idea of law school for Bible college, but I digress. As for Thomason, she just wanted the same things that we all do. To have the things that she needed, maybe a few creature comforts, and a little personal freedom. These are the things that Black Phillip promised her and which Christianity has always framed as bad, prideful, and just a little bit too self-serving. Now, the question here is, did she have to become a murderous harpy stealing babies to make flying ointment in order to have those things? I don't know. All I saw was her getting legit high and ascending to the treetops in the throes of ecstasy at the end. Who knows what she signed off on in that book? And that brings me to my last observation. No matter the context, religious, secular, whatever, being closed-minded and unteachable never yields good results. I have to wonder what would have happened to this family if William had simply taken a step back, considered other points of view, 
learned a thing or two and either changed his thinking or got comfortable with the notion of agreeing to disagree. You know, I was pretty big into what I believed too. The difference though was that I was always willing to see other points of view. I knew there were things about what I was being taught to believe that were wrong and I was and am always willing to listen to other points of view. That's not to say that I wasn't a seething legalist, but I was a legalist who would at least listen to someone else's viewpoint. Even if I knew going in that I was going to dismiss it, I would still listen. William had no counter apologetic beyond you're wrong, I'm right, and that's it. It's time to learn better. Again, it's been 300 years. The things this family went through and succumbed to were clearly inflated and unrealistic, but the concepts they represent, isolation, fear, loss, inner conflict, and more, are very real in terms of the consequences tied to narrow thinking and religious dogma. We don't need to live deliciously, just practically. And that means accepting that not everyone is going to think like us, but also being satisfied that we don't have to think like them. Thomason went from being controlled by one religion to being controlled by another. I would have liked to see her a year later and been able to gauge for myself whether or not she got what she bargained for, because living in the woods and hunting babies doesn't sound all that delicious to me. Did Black Philip deliver on his promises, or did he simply collect and ensnare Thomason for his own purposes? The way I see it, that's the point of every religion, and it's why we need to strive to be a little less like everyone in this story and a little more committed to concepts like free thought, skepticism, and truth, because those are the things that lead to getting and staying unbound. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.